Till now we have been learning about natural dyes or vegetable dyes that how harmonious they are towards nature and therefore they are very uh, friendly to man. And in order to be able to use it more extensively and just keeping them at par with the synthetic dyes, it is important to standardize the natural dyes or the vegetable dyes. Now, I gave you an example yesterday that if the same plant is grown by organized farming in northeastern India and say for example, the indigo and the same indigo plantation is carried out in somewhere in the uh, Madhya Pradesh and the same indigo if it is uh, grown in the southern part of India, all the three indigos will have a different kind of indigo tin uh, yield in their product. Now, the plantation remains the same, but the content of indigo tin in all these three regions were found to be different. And the reason I gave you was that this is because of the climatic condition firstly, secondly the soil and water condition and third is the farming condition. So, because of this variation in three parameters, the dye content in the plantation varied. Now, if a supplier, if a manufacturer of natural dye is supposed to be collecting material from different places, then he needs to standardize them, so that it does not give any variation in color. Because if the dye percentage is low or high, it would reflect on the dyeing. So, therefore, it is important that standardization of vegetable dyes is also understood very clearly. Now, this chapter will be dedicated to the standardization of natural dyes. What are the problems that one encounters while doing the standardization? Natural dyeing has the problem of standardization. In 1971, Rita Adrosco wrote about vegetable dyes in natural dyes and home dyeing book, saying that craftsmen are becoming increasingly enthusiastic about this outdated and time consuming process for one of the reasons that manufacturers reject it because of difficulty of standardization. Natural dye stuff produce offbeat one of a kind color. No two dye lots are identical and have very stubble differences due to impurities peculiar to the particular plant material used. So, the, the craftsmen who were having this kind of difficulty, first thing is that it is a time consuming process. Second thing is that there is no standardization available. Every time it is a new color or new hue or new stain and therefore, no two dyes you know lot would give the same uh, identification because the dye contents were different. Now, that created a lot of uh, difficulty for the craftsmen. The problem of course, with raw botanicals is that the numerous chemical ingredients that make up plants vary widely. Not only do the variations occur between plants of the sp same species but also from part to part of the same plant. So, that for instance, in madder the dye is contained in the roots and not so much in the leaves. The type and quantity of chemicals present are affected by such things as soil, species, weather, time of harvest as well as the part of the plant that is being used. The manner in which they are stored and processed also has a profound effect. Color varies greatly with plants grown in different areas due to mineral content of the soil and various other factors of the growth. So, I gave you these many factors which actually affect. What are these factors? The soil factor, which species is grown where, 
the weather, the time of um, plantation and so on. And then also because you know the way it has been the part of the plant also which is being used for dye extraction is also very important. Now, I will give you one example as what is given here, madder roots have maximum uh, uh, dye content, stem has a little less and leaves have the least of dye content. But at the same time, the same madder if we try to use the root, then the plant will be gone. So, all along I have been emphasizing that one should look at the plant parts which are renewable, which can grow again. If we destroy the root, then the plant will be gone or will be dead. Therefore, we have to concentrate on the plant parts which give optimal dye content, but are also equally renewable or can be regenerated. Trial and error methods were the ones which were tried initially, although now there are standardized methods available. But initially, there were lot of trials and error methods that were tried. Dyers learnt by trial and error what to pick and when and where to pick it. They passed down their knowledge from generation to generation, often keeping trade secrets from outsiders. Dyers of course used colour as a control. They kept trying to determine which plant, which part of plant, which species what growing condition and what time of harvest would produce the color closest to one they wanted. But they also had many other variables to worry about such as water, utensils used and so on. Dyes prepared in tin pot gave a color different than the ones prepared in iron pot. To obtain the desired color, time after time the dyer had to know all this. If he did not get what he want, was looking for, he knew that something was wrong and the raw materials used or with the manufacturing process had to figure out what and how to adjust it. So, you see that there were many, many parameters that the dyer had to keep in mind. It is not only the plant species, it is not only the plant part that should be you know specified, but a thorough study of the time of harvest, when is the best time, when is the plant having the maximum dye content, because plants also go through their biosynthetic pathway. Dyes are not, it is not like a factory that it is synthesized just uh, in a day. It, it, it has its own gradual biosynthetic process. So, if the harvesting is done at the initial stages of the biosynthetic pathway of the dye a molecule, the dye content obviously will be very low. Therefore, it is important for the dyer to know when to choose, what to choose, how to choose and then the procedure, the harvesting conditions, the soil conditions all put together, what is the optimal condition for farming was first established. Then after that was established, then the second thing that came to their mind was, when is the optimal condition for harvesting? How should these plant parts be stored? Because even storage can cause deterioration in color. So, the whole purpose of growing that plant would be lost if the entire plant cannot provide the dye content. If suppose it is stored badly and there is a fungal growth on it, Obviously, the color content will go down and therefore, it was important to figure out all these um, important parameters and to optimize them. An effort to standardize natural colors. In an effort to standardize colors, dye plants were often cultivated rather than gathered wild. Many were grown commercially. In order to get a standard color from a particular species of dye plant, 400 years ago, the farmer would have had to have worked empirically by selecting and cultivating plants that produced a dye that got closer and closer to the color he wanted. He would also have had to 
have tried growing the plants under different conditions to see what type of soil etc. is required, gave the, which would give him the best results. When he reached his goal, he would then have had to maintain the results by always growing the same species under the same conditions using color as his control. By keeping good records and adjusting the variables, he learned by experience how to obtain the desired color, but it was not easy and exactly the same in each time. Even today, it is not possible to precisely match color from batch to batch, not even with synthetic dyes. So, you see this task is very tedious, but with hit and trial methods, by error and trial methods, these were tried to optimize to the best of the capability of the farmer or the dyer. To produce fully standardized eco-friendly vegetable dyes from potential herbal vegetable sources, evaluation of the color, natural color for eco-friendliness, standardization of processes for various textile substrates, large scale production and development of commercial natural dyes, there are certain specifications that need to be followed and they are, we will see in the next slide that what are these specifications that needs to be kept in mind while standardizing any natural dye from any natural source, because this law holds good for all of them, because none of these were initially standardized. So, therefore, if it has to be used in commercial processes, one cannot do all these trials all along. Then what would happen from batch to batch, the color will vary. And if the color varies from batch to batch, that is not acceptable to the consumer. So, the specifications that need to be followed are color, appearance, optical density, water soluble matter, pH of the water extract ash content and color component and its tinctorial value and the total suspended solids that are present when the dye is extracted and dried. So, mainly you will see that there are 8 things that need to be kept in mind. First is the color, that means what is the color we are concentrating. Suppose if we take an example of madder, madder has a color between orangish red to orange. So, this color has to be fixed. Now, appearance, whether it looks like dull color or a bright color will also be kept in mind. Then the optical density, I told you in the last few lectures when we were doing the fundamental methods of evaluation of dye stuff, how UV visible spectrophotometer helps us to find out the dye content and the dye content is reflected by the optical density. That means, there is a direct relationship between the dye molecule concentration and the absorbance. It is directly proportional. So, it is easy to ascertain the optical density. Water soluble matter. Now, if a dye has to be used for dyeing and most of the dyeing processes 99.9% .9 are carried out in water. The dye should bear minimum the uh, should qualify to be a water soluble material. Otherwise, it is, does not fit into the category of dyes. pH of water extract, if the pH is very high or if it is too low, it will become either very alkaline or very acidic respectively. And such adverse acidic or alkaline conditions are not good for the fabric. It will eat up the fabric. So, one has to keep a track of the pH of the water extract of the dye. Then the burning of that ash content gives an idea about what would be the kind of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur content in that color component and its tinctorial value. What is the colorant molecule? We had learnt about the structures of various types of colored molecules, indigoid dyes, anthraquinoid dyes, and anthracyanidine dyes, uh, dihydropyran dyes, 
and so on and so forth carotenoid dyes. So, these are basically be the color varies because of the structure and the structure has a oxochrome component and a chromophore component to be responsible for the color content. So, that adds the tinctorial value to it and then when this dye is uh, totally extracted in the water solution a lot of other plant material also get co extracted and therefore, they uh, you know create a lot of uh, total solid suspended solid content. So, all that would also matter. Now, if the total suspended solids are higher than much 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 higher than the dye content, the dye will get lost in that. If the, if the dye is more and the suspended solids are lesser in ratio, then it is considered to be a good dye. So, these are a few points which need to be understood very clearly and these are the specification color appearance, optical density, water solubility, pH of the water extract, ash content, color component and its tinctorial value and the suspended solid content. These are 8 specifications which need to be taken into consideration while standardizing the natural dyes. Procedure for the extraction of coloring matter in aqueous medium has to be standardized at pilot and bulk scale plant, shade cards having shades of fabric and dyed yarn having good light wash and rough fastness need to be produced for each natural dye. But still the problem of re reproducibility arises, dye from one company does not necessarily give the same shade as the dye from another company. Comparative study has been carried out for three dyes that is Acacia Ketachu that is Ketachu Kutch, the second one is Rubia Cordifolia or Mangis and the third one is Quercus Infectoria or Gallnut. Table 1 in the next slide will show that the difference in their pH and total suspended solid contents in the dye supplied by different companies have been tabulated. The dyes show that UV spectrum, visible spectrum as well as FTIR spectrum show difference which goes to show that there is definitely difference in their optical density which is the root cause of their difference in dye ability and color. This exercise of standardization was carried out to confirm this fact. Now, this particular work was extensively done in our laboratory because we were trying to help two different companies to standardize. Now, the way we started doing it was through these analytical machines which are ideally used for evaluation of the dye content. Now, only when the dye content are the same the color and the tinctorial value and other things will match. If there is a dis, uh, difference in their UV visible spectrum, if there is a difference in their IR spectrum, there is bound to be difference. Secondly, we, it was also observed that the pH and the total solid content also made difference. It, that is why among these um, parameters or specifications for standardization, pH of also plays a very vital role because some of the uh, dyes are very, very pH sensitive. So, there in uh, the color intensifies at a particular uh, pH, but it changes to another hue color, particularly the anthocyanidin dyes. What happens is that under a acidic condition, they are more towards the red and under alkaline condition they become blue or purple. So, this has to be kept in mind that if we are looking at anthocyanin dyes and the extraction must be done uh, under acidic condition, but that acidic condition should not be very high. Otherwise, if it is very high acidified solution, it may corrode the fabric. So, all these things have to be kept in mind. Three examples were taken from two different companies in order to check whether these dyes have the same value or they have different value. If they have the same value, they will give same result, 
but if they have different values obviously they will give different results and that is what we observed. Now in this table where a comparative study of the pH and the total suspended solids is shown, Manjit's two sample from company 1 and company 2 are labeled as man 1, man 2 had different pH. Now one had 7.28 and the other one had 6.04 which is fairly different. The total suspended solids in um, Manjis 1 sample was found to be 787.6 gram per kilogram. At the same time the other company sample uh, showed a very low total suspended solid. So now I was just telling you the example. If the total suspended solid is higher than the dye or if the total suspended solid by itself is a very high value, obviously the color content will get overshadowed. Similar examples were seen in Acacia catechu. Here of course there were samples drawn from other sources also and we tried to evaluate six different samples AC1, AC2, AC3, AC4, AC5, AC6. AC1 and AC2 were from the two different companies whom we were trying to help in standardization. The pH did not vary too much but only in the case of AC3 and AC4 the pH was uh, 5.34 otherwise most of the pHs were in the region of 6 or 6.99 to 6.05. Now when we started looking at the total suspended solid we found that there was a fairly uh, big amount of variation. There was very high TSS total suspended solid in the case of the sample number 5 and the lowest suspended solid was um, the value was uh, 74.3 for the case of the third sample. So you see the variation itself goes to show that they are not similar. They have lot of major differences and we will go and understand this as we go along. The third example was the Dicurcus in Victoria or the gall nut which is used both as a dye as well as as a natural mordant. Now these were from two different companies, the same two companies and the pH was more or less similar and it was found that the uh, total suspended solid however varied. In the first case it was 107 whereas in the second case it was about uh, seven, uh, 179. So that was the difference that caused them to act or die differently. Now if we try to look at the comparative study of the FTIR of just the Manjist sample that is Rubia cordifolia sample you will see that the red spectrum is given by the first sample and the yellow sample is given by the second sample and there are minor differences in the spectrum. Now as I told you that FTIR spectrum tells us about the functionality. So therefore in the Manjis dye there are variations of some of the components get being in different proportion. We had learned when we were doing Manjis or Rubia cordi cordifolia that it has anthroquinoid dyes and among the anthroquinoid dyes it has six different types of components which makes the anthroquinone and uh, this Manjis or uh, dye as a dye. Now because of the variation in these six components the dye is showing different FTIR spectrum which differs only marginally. Now if we look at the samples of the catechu, even there all the six samples show have show minor minor differences which is an indication we saw that there were changes in the pH, there were changes in the total suspended solid and now there are changes also in the FTIR spectrum. Now this is the example for Cucus infectoria, the three different spectrum 
uh, or the two different samples show that there are differences, they, it is not totally superimposable. If suppose the quickest in Victoria samples were identical, the spectrum would have been totally superimposable and there would not have been any differences. But by and large, they have similar groups and so the dye content may only be the variable in this case. When we try to look at the visible and UV spectrum of the same two dyes in the case of Manjist 1 and in the case of Manjist 2, the, there are obvious differences in the UV in the visible spectrum because this is a spectrum which is recorded between 400 to 800 nanometer and that is the region for visible light because we can only see or the all the dyes fall in that region. Now, when we try to look at the 6 UV visible spectrum of the catechu samples, you will see that there are very obvious differences in the case of a, a, the samples 1 to 6 and these differences are re reflected on the visible spectrum of these uh, this dye also. And therefore, we know that there are very, very discrete differences in the samples. Similar examples were seen, but here the only difference that one can see in the case of Curcus in Victoria, Q, uh, QI sample 1 and QI sample 2, that more or less the spectrum that is shown or the graph that is shown between 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers is showing a very similar pattern. There, there are no um, uh, difference in the pattern except the optical density is higher for the sample number 1 and the optical density that is the absorbance is slightly lower for the sample number 2. And this is very, very obvious from this uh, visible spectrum of Hircus in Victoria. So, when we try to look at the quality standards of the vegetable dyes, quality standards for vegetable dyes vary widely. So, it is necessary to first contact an import, importer to find out what they are looking for. The problem arises with standardization of the colors as no two dye plots are identical. Technicians in the pharmacology, food and textile industry load this lack of consistency. Now, you see if there is so much of variation, then it is kind of hard to uh, you know be able to use it for a specific purpose. Suppose if a consumer or if a dyer has to have a shade and he develops a procedure that I, I will take this much of the dye powder and this is how the procedure will go on and with for the this much of fabric weight of mm, this much dye should be optimum. All that will go haywire because there is uh, no mm, uh, you know recipe that will fit in. Today the recipe is fitting, tomorrow's lot when he gets the dye it will not fit he will again have to uh, vary. So, it was necessary that some kind of standardization must be done by the manufacturer and provide that standardized data giving mainly the optical density information particularly and the pH and the total suspended uh, content. So, that when the dyer is developing a procedure he knows how much dye he should take for a particular weight of the fabric because dye is always taken with effect to the weight of the fabric and that kind of relationship must be known to the dyer from the manufacturer then only the vegetable dyes can be called as standardized dye. And then only they can be used as easily as what the synthetic dyes are used off the shelf. So, it is important that there are some things that need to be carried out very carefully. 
and those uh, for attempting that the, there is a repeatability of shade. The textile dyeing is recommended for procedures as mentioned in the earlier chapters which I have mentioned in the earlier lectures, but strictly a few things must be followed in order to keep other parameters intact. Use of only stainless steel dye bath. Second is water hardness should not be more than 300 ppm and the third thing is that uh, yarn water ratio should be 1 is to 20. These are basic fundamentals for the dyer to observe and then if he gets the manufacturer certified dyes from the manufacturer then that will fit into the system and still some repeatability can be obtained. Reproducibility of shade is a big, big criteria when we work with natural dyes or vegetable dyes. We just saw one example, I had fleetingly mentioned that when the dyers were making observation, they found that if the dye is extracted in tin pot, it shows different hue color and if it is extracted in iron pot, it gives different color. Now why is that happening? What causes the tin, presence of tin and iron to make the same dye look so different in their extracts? Now these are certain things which we will learn while we are doing mordenting and that is why the, there is an attempt for stainless steel dye bath usage. Because if we use stainless steel dye bath, then there is no effect of the stainless steel on the dye extract. Whatever metal participation we uh, observed in the case of tin or uh, iron pot was, was eliminated. So at least one hurdle was taken care of. Secondly, if the water is hard, then the miscibility of the dye and its adherence to the fabric will be affected by the presence of these uh, calcium magnesium salts which are a part of hardness of water. So it is important that when dyeing is carried out, it should be done with soft water. So there should be a procedure by which the hardness should be reduced or at least kept under check and the hardness, water hardness should not be more than 300 ppm. And also the yarn to water ratio is a very important criteria. If we make a very concentrated solution, even that is not very good because dye aggregates will form. If we make very dilute solution, then no color will adhere to the fabric. It will be so light that several times the dye will have to be done. So there was an optimization of the dye to yarn or dye to fabric ratio which was set. It should be somewhere between 1 is to 20. Sometimes for certain dyes which have good dye adher uh, adherence, it can be reduced to 1 is to 15, but definitely not less than that. So these are certain factors which need to be kept in mind. And so if I have to conclude this chapter, I would say that several things have to be kept in mind, but the main thing that needs to be kept in mind is the optical density and that could be only obtained from the visible spectrum of the dye. If we have a example, I will go back again to Manjis. See in this case, the optical densities also were different. Not only did the spectrum show a different, uh, you know, line graph uh, where uh, there were um, uh, ups and downs at uh, different positions, that is the troughs and the, the peaks were on a different point, showing that the chromophoric groups are slightly different in each case. And that was only possible because of the difference in the six components of Manjis because they were not in equal distribution. Suppose if we have in a class 
six boys of the same height. Then we say that the average height is so much and therefore the optical density becomes uh, like an average. I am just giving an example for you to understand. But the same thing if there are boys of different heights, then the average will show a different value. It will not be the same as the average of the previous case. Similarly, when the uh, you know concentrations of these six components, alizarine, perfurin, pseudo perfurin and so on and so forth are different, then the, the graph also looks different or the spectrum looks different and the spectrum looking different means its optical density is also different. Also you will see that the absorbance value for the Manjis sample 1 is slightly lower than the Manjis sample 2. That means the dye content in these two samples is also different. So, the pH was different, the total suspended solids were different and the visible spectrum was different, the FTIR spectrum was different. So, that is how we try to do the standardization of vegetable dyes. All the instruments, the pH uh, is evaluated with the help of a pH meter, total suspended solid is uh, also evaluated by the method that you know the dye solution is evaporated and the weight of before and after are taken and that is how one tries to evaluate the total suspended solids. Similarly, UV visible spectrophotometer evaluates the UV uh, visible spectrum, the FTIR uh, machine evaluates the FTIR spectrum and all put together give us an idea that the dye is similar in its dye content or dissimilar. And if it is dissimilar, what is the kind of ratio that must be enhanced for sample 1 to become like sample 2. So, these are the optimization processes which need to be backed up by instrumentational methods. Mm -hmm.